Craig R. Bexley is an American filmmaker born in 1949. The former stunt coordinator, seen here as second unit on Predator, started as a series director in the 80s, shooting mainly TV movies, not all of which had a video release so difficult or impossible to find in watchable quality, and some episodes for TV series. For Sniper 2, Left Behind 3 and his Stephen King adaptations like The Kingdom Hospital see the same named special. In 1988, Bexley's debut feature, Action Jackson is a Detroit cop nickname which every five minutes for no reason someone tones into the camera until your ears start to bleed and fall off, who is now thanks to excessive police violence on desk duty. When several union leaders are killed by a hit squad, Jackson determines that his nemesis to whom he owes his suspension is behind it. Delaplane is not even afraid to murder his own wife, played by Sharon Stone after all. He foists this on Jackson, who now wants to bring him to justice together with Delaplane's ex-lover, deserved Razy for 80s pop starlet Vanity. The box office success, and even more later on video, was completely understandable, torn apart by most critics. As there is no story here, the casting is adventurous and hardly any of the embarrassing gags land. It's such a typical 80s action flick that it comes off more like a satire. Jackson jumps on moving cars, throws enemies from building to building and even drives a sports car upstairs. The title that was marketed in Germany as a continuation is in fact originally called Dangerous Passion, a TV movie from 1990 which has, except for the same lead, nothing to do with action Jackson. Dark Angel from 1990 is about the drug investigator Kane, who loses his partner during an observation and finds several henchmen of the drug lord with mysteriously cut throats at the crime scene. The murder weapon turns out to be a magnetic flying disc belonging to an alien drug dealer who injects people with an overdose of heroin in order to subsequently take the adrenochrome, uh, I mean of course, endorphin from their brains, a desired narcotic on its planet. Hunted by an alien police officer who before his death as Kane and his FBI partner for help and hands him his gun. If you I come in peace, the alien's utterly moronic motto and the US title couldn't make in America its 7 million dollar budget at the box office back and was at first a flop but became later a hit on video. The wildly cobbled together mix of the hidden predator and every conceivable 80s buddy cop action movie cliche is only held together by the outstanding camera work of Mark Irwin. See also The Dead Zone, The Fly, The Blob, Fright Night 2, Robocop 2, Scream, the excellent practical effects and fast paste editing. and squanders, thanks to a half-hearted illogical story and Dolph Lundgren's so-called acting, the chance to become a true genre classic. In 1991, former football player Brian Bosworth tries to play former cop Joe Huff, who, thanks FBI blackmailing, infiltrates Stone Cold in the same named Action Cucumber, a criminal far-right rocker gang under the name John Stone. In doing so, he blows the whistle and, in principle, fails completely. Since he neither saves the key witness slash his new girlfriend, he even persuades her to stay when she wants to flee and he witnesses her death, nor prevents anything. They come even with motorcycles effortlessly into the heavily guarded courthouse to free a gang member. Simply storm and shoot down everyone, what a secret master plan, and Stone arrives only when judge, prosecutor, hostages, policemen, soldiers and so on are already dead. No one gets saved here. The lunatic muscle action and boobs show with questionable message in which every collision pushes a little too early explosion in front of it, so bad that it's almost entertaining again, made from the 25 million dollar costs only 9 million in the US back and was rightly a huge bomb. Worth mentioning is the trailer action scene with the motorcycle jump into the helicopter, the only reason why I even watched it back then. 
A similar scene is also in Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which came out two months later. The alleged sequel from 1997, marketed in Germany as Stone Cold 2 Heart of Stone, is called in reality Back in Business and, similar to allegedly Action Jackson 2, has nothing to do with the original except for the same lead. In the 1992 TV action thriller Revenge on the Highway aka Silent Thunder, a veteran trucker is searching for the truck that ran over his son during a flat tire on the highway. Not believing it was an accident, he starts his own investigation. The passable US highway drama with more than obvious borrowings from Steven Spielberg's brilliant 1971 classic duel, also about a psychopathic trucker who uses his vehicle as a deadly weapon, appeared in Germany as Trucker 2. Although it has nothing to do with the so-called trucker, aka High Bailin from 1978. The watchable TV psycho horror drama A Family Torn Apart, aka Sudden Fury from 1993, based on the same named 1989 Leslie Walker novel, after a 1984 true incident, is about one of three adopted boys who allegedly killed his new parents. In the ultra cheap 1994 TV science fiction thriller Deep Red, an emotionally battered private detective tries to protect a little girl in whom alien nano things, so called rats, have taken up residence, which repair body cells and practically make young and virtually indestructible. In her case, even the only red thingies that don't decay within hours, so called deep rats with which an evil scientist wants to make himself immortal. The way to well cast film noir wannabe with Terminator elements looks like a trashy science fiction channel Blade Runner replicant on amateur level. The TV thriller drama bore Deconstructing Sarah from the same year is about an advertising executive who leads a secret double life and disappears. Whereupon her best friend starts investigating and then infiltrates the shady underworld herself to find out what happened. The quite entertaining 1995 TV western drama The Avenging Angels is about the leader of the title giving secret defense force of the Mormons. A sect split from Christianity that settled in Utah in mid 19th century who prevents an assassination plan against their leader. In the process, he discovers a widespread web of hypocrisy and intrigue. In the rather mediocre 1996 TV crime drama Twisted Desire, based on a 1990 murder case, a teenage girl convinces a love-struck young ex-con that they can only be together if they get rid of their domineering parents. The movie unnecessarily adds another friend, for which she betrays the ex-con to the authorities in order to be with him, only to be herself turned in when he finds out what she has done. The real crime back then involved only a 14-year-old girl and her 17 year old slightly retarded boyfriend slash pothead. The credits say that he is still in prison, which was true in 1996, but he was executed in 2000, while she was released after a few years. In the TV thriller Twilight Man from the same year, a university professor has to deal with a hacker who destroys his entire life, even killing his girlfriend and planting evidence to frame him. The completely implausible The Fugitive meets the net mishmash doesn't even come close to any of those. Under Pressure is a firefighter in the same named 1997 US thriller who is stylized as a hero by the media after he saved a child in a fire. But in reality he is a psychopath abandoned by his family who terrorizes his neighbors, which he hallucinates for his own ungrateful wife and child with deadly results. In Bad Day on the Block original title, Sheen tries his best but can't really convince as a villain at any moment. Everything seems very contrived. The script relies too often on crazy coincidences and the atypical completely illogical behavior of some characters, which sometimes forget how to make a phone call 
or how to read an address. An officer hides for no reason vital information about the suspect from her partner and so on. The rather predictable 1998 TV drama Silencing Mary is about a college reporter who, after her roommate is raped by the school star football player, uncovers secrets about the crimes on the campus, becoming herself the target of harassment. In the 1999 TV fantasy drama A Touch of Hope, Dean Kraft, which means in German power by the way, in real life a so-called energy healer who also wrote the screenplay, finds out that he is able to heal people with his bare hands. So he teams up with a medical scientist to prove that faith healing is possible. Most people are probably more familiar with another Anthony Michael Hall character with supernatural touch abilities. Namely three years later as psychic Johnny Smith in the highly recommendable The Dead Zone TV series. The best you can get. Chameleon 2 Deathmatch from the same year is the second of three entertaining TV science fiction action movies 1998 to 2000 set in the far future of 2028. In Stuart Cooper's Chameleon, Superkiller Cam, a genetic creation of Cougar, Hawk and Chameleon, among other things with camouflage abilities, discovers her maternal instincts during a mission and tries to protect a child from the government. Craig A. Bexley and Russell King's Die Hard 2 clone Chameleon 2 goes into a bit more detail about her animalistic abilities. There she is called into action again when the customers of a luxury casino are taken hostage by a criminal. In John Lafayette's Chameleon 3 Dark Angel, Cam tries to prevent the plans of her evil twin brother. According to an unconfirmed source, the movies are apparently failed pilots that were not picked up as a series. And they are often compared to James Cameron's Dark Angel, which aired 2000 to 2002, which is also set in a dystopian future and is also about a genetically enhanced sex bomb, uh, whatsoever. And the idea obviously stolen from Chameleon, uh, I mean, of course, got inspired by it. In the Rosemary's Baby inspired, very well staged TV psycho horror The Glow from 2002, based on the same named book by Brooks Stanwood, aka Howard and Susan Kaminsky from 1979, New York City newlyweds move into a low rent apartment in a building for retirees. When another young couple in the building disappears, they begin to notice, but mainly the woman who feels increasingly uncomfortable in the company of the domineering elderlies, that their neighbors are watching their every move. In 2005, a billionaire in the Triangle wants to find out what's up with the disappearance of ships and airplanes in the Bermuda Triangle. Therefore, he puts together a crew of experts, scientists, journalists, engineer, psychic, who investigate the phenomenon on the spot. Soon it becomes clear that it is about much more than a few disappeared ships. Affected people seem to experience alternate realities and the military tries to hinder the investigation. The second half turns into a kind of sequel to the 1940s Philadelphia Experiment, described in the same named 1984 movie. The well-cast, watchable four-hour miniseries has passable effects for its time. If you need The same is true for the following year for the highly recommendable four-and-a-half-hour miniseries The Lost Room. There a detective is given a key that opens any door, always leading to room 10 of the Sunshine Motel aka the Lost Room. When you leave you get to the place of your imagination, if not the room randomly selects one. In addition to this key there are other so-called objects, which also have incredible abilities, but also often become the obsession of their owners. When his little daughter is kidnapped by a ruthless collector and disappears without a trace in room 10 during a failed hostage exchange. His only hope to get her back is by finding the so-called primary object that supposedly controls all other ones. In 2008, Aces and Aids, settlers with railroad land suddenly find themselves being ruthlessly gunned down. 
with no law and order to be found, justice falls onto the shoulders of an elderly rancher and a retired gunslinger. Bexley's last directorial feature is an old-fashioned TV western with some completely out-of-place brutal scenes, which seem as they try with brutal force to elevate the hastily slapped together predictable stories. Yeah.